underdogs, underestimated, we the ones It's the underdogs back with you for another week. And can you hear that music? That's right. It's Olympic week. And that's not all. A little bit later in the show, we're actually going to stick a tiny little toe into the political realm. Don't worry. It's not going to be partisan. We're not going to tell you who to vote for. But there's well, we could. Really... We could tell people who to vote for. That's right. There are some really interesting things we've seen. <laughs> that are happening right now in the election that dovetail with all these lessons we've learned about underdogs in sports. But first, yes, that music was clear. It is Olympic week. The opening ceremonies are Friday. By the time you listen or watch, listen to this or watch, the games have already started. The U.S. is playing France in men's soccer. And here he is, noted French soccer expert, Peter Keating. Are you excited for the Olympics right now? Oui, Jordan. <laughs> Bonsoir. Uh, Jordan, this is the time. We, this is the time we make an exception. We usually get annoyed when people say rings are the only thing that matter. Well, now, Jordan, five rings are the only five. thing that matter. <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Well, we've we've dug into some different kinds of analysis here. So let's start big picture, Peter. We built a model that can somewhat project medal counts. And it's not based on what you might think. So you explain this better than I can. Tell our our watchers, our listeners, what the hell we did to figure out what countries will win the most medals. Well, look, Jordan, if you want to predict Olympic medals, you could sit down with a big map at a big table. You could go through each of the 329 Olympic sports uh, of events that will happen in Paris. You could try to project who's going to medal at each one of those based on their age, their performance, their height, whatever you think is important, right? You could add all that up and you get your medal table. But Jordan, not only would that involve a lot of uncertainty, it involve a lot of unnecessary work. It'd be like projecting a baseball season by going through every team's 162 games one by one. You don't need to do that. Here's why. It's so expensive and it's really so professional. I mean, almost industrial, a process to develop an Olympic champion that all you really need to start with are basic chunks of big level socioeconomic data. Jordan, to produce Olympic winners, you need to be a big country. You need to be a, a rich country. And what we found is you actually can't be that unequal a country. You have to distribute your wealth at least even enough that a lot of people have a chance at success. You start out with those factors, you can predict medal counts pretty accurately. Right. So we studied a lot of different base level data about countries, right? Population size. Uh, GDP as a measure of economic success. And kind of morbidly, we look at infant mortality rate, which sort of measures how, as as a measure of equality, but also just how well a country takes care of its populace, right? You have to, sadly, part of being a great athlete is developing healthy, safe people. And and it it, it, it turns out again, sadly, that infant mortality rate tracks inversely with well it, i mean it, it's 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 a sad fact of life that that's what matters but it makes sense i mean you, you're talking about basically human development being you know what the econ economists call human development being part of developing successful athletes so you do that now jordan there are other things that matter right mm -hmm. when we went and we dug into all the data there's a lot of other things that matter you, you can imagine some of them easily home field advantage and you know mm -hmm. home Host countries have a lot of advantages in the Olympics. You don't have to travel much to get there. Your teams automatically qualify for events, right? You're playing in front of friendly crowds, which can influence athletes and judges. So that's a big deal. Host countries actually win about 50% more medals the year they're doing the Olympics than the year before or after. The twist I like about that is that host countries now get to pitch new sports. They're the ones the IOC listens to. So in, in Tokyo, um, guess what? We got karate. Uh, surfboarding, climbing, um, uh, 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 baseball and softball were brought back to the Olympics. And to uh, the, the Japanese teams won more medals in each of those events than any other country. So there was a big home field advantage there. I'm not so sure that's going to happen with France, although, you know, breaking, which we can talk about later, is a yep. new sport. And there are some, you know, there are some hot French break dancers, as far as I can tell. So that's 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 another thing you have to factor in. 
Right. Well, to your point, in in the 2020 Olympics, which, as we know, took place in 2021. Right. Japan, so I never know what to call them. Right. Is it I think it's 20, still 2020. Yeah. I Japan, think it's just Tokyo, the Tokyo Games. Yeah. Japan won 58 medals, including 27 golds at home. In in 2016, they won 41 medals and only 12 golds. In 2012, 38 medals and seven golds. So you can see the trend there just with one country alone. And that certainly bodes well, bodes well for France this year. Yeah, I'll tell you something else that matters. Sometimes you have governments that channel an inordinate amount of a country's resources into specifically producing Olympic champions. For years and years and years during the Cold War, communist nations thought it was a real badge of honor to go out and beat Western countries in the Olympics. That's not jingoism, it's by you know from their own words. And, mm -hmm. and countries like the Soviet Union and East Germany went on these immense programs to, you know, get people to recruit athletes, get them into the military, subsidize them, turn them into champions. Sometimes that shaded over into intense doping programs, you know, the remnants of which are still scattered around the world. So you have to consider that too. And I think the, obviously the best country in the world, at, or should I say the country in the world most efficient at doing that right now is China. I mean, they're recruiting athletes at least at, at, from the age of six in categories that award lots of medals and they're turning them in to medalists. You have to account for that when you project this stuff. Well, that, and that's one of the most interesting things that pops out when you start looking at this right away, right? So China and India are the two most populous countries in the world by a lot. And, and China's barely beating India. China has about 17.4% of the world's population, India 17.3%. But then you look at, at the living conditions and the economic conditions in those countries. China's GDP per capita is about a little, about $12,500. Not fantastic, certainly not on par with Europe or the United States, but it's something. India, and that's basically economic activity right. per person, right? Yes. Right. India is about $2,400 per capita. So while it's, whereas China is about 17.9% of the, of the world GDP, India is about 3.4%. It's, 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 it's it said, India... 49th in the in the world in, in infant mortality rate, China 167th. So sa sadly, we know about the living. India has always been considered the sleeping giant in a lot of sports, right? Like, why can't they, man with that country that size, why can't they be more proficient in soccer, for instance, the world's game? But you see the sort of some of the living conditions, the economic conditions, to say nothing about different cultural memes, but it, it, it's, it's just sad to see these systemic, things getting in the way of athletic success and progress. Well, yes. I mean, it's like the real world, right? I mean, my dad, I don't know about anybody you know, but my dad hated to look at these Olympic medal counts when I was growing up. So this mm -hmm. is completely not the spirit of the Olympics. The IOC still doesn't do official medal counts because they, mm -hmm. they actually say there aren't countries participating in the Olympics. There are only athletes from different Olympic committees. But that's no longer the world which, that we live in, right? right? And China does a better job, um, a model very different from the U.S. You know, the U.S. and a lot of Western countries do supply some fun, uh, considerable funding and development to athletes, but it's kind of bottom up. The U.S. really is a confederation of Olympic federations, right? China does an amazing, uh, puts an amazing amount of energy and money into top-down channeling the resources of their country, whatever the sporting culture, into events that they think they ought to be able to meddle in. And, you know, there's a story from the South China Morning Post just a couple of weeks ago about how the Chinese have been recruiting athletes as from the age of six to become weightlifters, you know, picking out six to 11 year olds and saying, yeah, you look like you could be a good weightlifter at the age of seven for the Olympics in 15 years and then putting them in specific programs. I feel like 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 a lot of mothers would be offended by <laughs> hearing your six-year-old looks like a future weightlifter. Well, yeah, and in some places of the world, the governments don't care. They turn them into weightlifters right. anyway. So, I mean, there's that too. But sporting, you mentioned sporting culture. That's part of it. Part of the India story has to be a big focus just culturally in India on a couple of sports in particular. Cricket, for example, right? Maybe rugby as opposed sure. to a sporting culture that either geographically or culturally or for whatever reasons encompasses um, excellence in lots of sports. That's one thing the U.S. has going for it. The U.S. is so sure. geographically and culturally diverse that our sporting culture ranges from excellence in basketball to beach volleyball, you know? Well, and, and this is something, in, in something interesting you pointed out in an article we wrote for The Athletic. All sports aren't equal, too. So, for instance— yeah. 
there's one men's basketball medal, period, right? There yeah. are how many bicycling right. medals? So they're each one sport, but one has a zillion right. different competitions in it. So if you happen to be good at one sport, you can pad your your medal count stats pretty quickly. So let's let's look at the projection system, actually, and see what that spits out. So according to our numbers, the U.S. should win 110 medals this year, China 86, Great Britain 63, France 50, Australia 46. Those should be the top five. And then when you get into the next sort of group, there are some really interesting countries that maybe aren't huge, that maybe aren't um, you know world powers in other ways, but like a country like New Zealand checks in, what, about 11th or 12th with 20 projected medals. So yeah. what do you see, Peter, about the countries that outperform um what their what the size of the country would, would would expect okay so first of all france had their worst olympics in a while last time around and now we project them at 50. there's a considerable home home country advantage there number one number two you're so right about the medals jordan i didn't realize this you realize in taekwondo because they have semifinals before the finals in every match they award two bronze medals for every event and they have different weight classes. And, you know, it's like it's like you put everything together that you could get more medals for. And they give out mm -hmm. they gave out 32 medals for 128 athletes last time around Taekwondo. All right. So who do you know that could be like that? Australia, uh, we project to win 46 medals. Really big in swimming. Right. The Netherlands up at 36, more than Canada or Brazil far bigger countries in both senses, right? Why? They're outstanding at cycling, which you just mentioned, tons of medals. So you put that all together, uh, China itself, at number, I know China doesn't have the dominance in medals that it wants to or expected to since Beijing in 2008, but to be second in the world um, is an impressive result. And it's the result of all these factors put together that we've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, I always, I, even Jamaica, right, is 138th in world population, but they've won... 48 medals going back to 2004, a lot of those obviously in track and field. Um, so if you can find your niche as a nation, you can yeah. make a real a real dent I mean, on the overall medal count. I mean, last time around, our models said the Dominican Republic, based on its social and economic factors, shouldn't win any medals at all. And they won five and it's baseball and track. And, you know, the Dominican Republic, has, as a, we all know, as a great sporting culture, there must be a lot of just national pride, resources, money, everything, time, effort, emotion, put into developing great athletes, you can outperform in, in, in the well, medal count. The other one is Cuba. That's like that, right? Yeah. Um, I think they're 14th in total medals since 2004. Um, obviously, boxing. Right, 50 years um, of great know, boxing, right? At right, least. like that makes a big, a big, big, big difference, and it sort of can outpace some of those other factors um, that we controlled for. But it's fun to just kind of run the numbers and and – and see what it spits out and then look back and, and, you know, look, you can, you can bet on metal counts. So you're happy to use that if, in that way, if you want, but it's also just fun to, to say, you know what, I don't, I don't know anything about sports, but just based on these factors in the world, what should the metal counts look like? Right. And it also, once you realize how expensive and hard and intense it is to produce Olympic champions, and you think about the Olympics, the Olympics have lots of dramatic competition, lots of people who, don't win who are supposed to. But, you know, they don't really have all that many out, completely out of nowhere long shots because it, that's exceptionally hard to do. By the time you get to the Olympics, it's hard to be unknown. So when it, when you do see an underdog win, this whole industrial process of producing champions should make you should make you appreciate, make us all appreciate underdogs even more because it's quite a feat to win when you're not supposed to at the Olympics. Well, speaking of underdogs and unders, it's time for our new favorite segment, the Under of the Week. It's brought to you by DraftKings. Dive into all the action with our partners at DraftKings Sportsbook. New customers bet 5 bucks and get 150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code UNDERDOGS. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. So, Peter, this week I'm looking to an Olympic sport. And I've got my eye on the U.S. men's basketball team. They play. I'm sure, I'm sure you do. Yeah, I do. I, I mean, I, they've I, been they've, they've they've been in quite some trouble for not going over on anything so far. Yeah, for sure. So, look, the U.S. plays Serbia and Nikola Jokic on Sunday. They met in an exhibition game a week ago and beat Serbia 105-79. But I'm not looking at the score here. I'm looking at total points, and I think I'm going under 181. Why? A couple reasons. One, 
I find early in competitions, whether it's the NCAA tournament or looking back at the Olympics four years ago, teams start slowly on offense. There's a variety of reasons why you can posit that that might be the case, whether it's nerves, whether it's lack of familiarity, whether it's a whole bunch of things. So here are the scores from 2020 or 2021, as it were, of (laughs) each first game in a group, right? Total points, 162, 159, that was the U.S. against France, 174, 151, 218, and 165. So five of the six games were under 181 and well under 181, Mm -hmm. okay? I think this is so high because the U.S.'s exhibition games have generally exceeded these totals. 158 was the first one against Canada, but then they went 190, 184, 201, 180. But those are exhibition games. I don't think anyone was playing full-out defense for 40 minutes. I think the U.S. is going to come in having given up 100 points to South Sudan. This team already was, the the word in practice was they were ahead of, of their offense on defense. The offense is still trying to click and catch up. They've been inconsistent. So I expect them to come out, play hard, play intense physical basketball, substitute a lot and try to win these games on defense. I think the shooting can be suspect early in these tournaments. And I like under 181 at the start. Jordan, against South Sudan, the U.S. was outscored 42 to 21 on three-pointers. I think when the U.S. comes to play defense, there is no way anything like that is going to happen again. The total is 181 for over-under. The U.S. scores 100 points. It's very hard to see Serbia, look, talented players, scoring 80 points. Usually we assume teams are playing at optimal or or if not maximal motivation. Clearly that wasn't true in these friendlies. When you hear Anthony Davis saying, we didn't play well because it traffic was heavy getting to the arena in London, um, they got their wake. They not only weren't playing intensely, they got their wake up call. And I, you know, under seems very smart here. And then you factor in what you always talk about that the, how teams start off slow. I, I think there's a great pick. Yeah. And, and look, even in that friendly against Serbia, which which did go over at 184 total points, the U.S. shot 16 for 36 from three. That's almost 45 percent. That's been the, the bugaboo for most Olympic teams from the U.S. over past years. I, I'm, I think there could be some shooting regression coming there. And again, add in tight nerves, exper- experienced players who've now seen each other. Again, you know, they're playing a familiar foe in Serbia. And I just feel like this will be a much more grinded out affair at least it's in the first game. So there we have it. Under 181 U.S. Serbia on Sunday. 